implemented or guided plans in urban and rural Oregon for light rail and streetcar systems, new urban boulevards, urban renewal, UGB expansions, the Springwater Corridor Rail Trail, the historic Columbia River Highway, and the Oregon Paleo Lands Center in Fossil. He led Gresham's transportation and community planning for 22 years. Richard is the vice chair of Old Bend Neighborhood Association since 2019. He's also served on Bend Citywide Transportation Advisory Committee and the Bend Charter Advisory Committee. He's chaired the Regional Public Tra Transit Advisory Committee for Cascades E-Trans East Transit and the Policy Subcommittee, Oregon Planning Association. He's a lifelong student of Oregon's natural and cultural history. He's lived in um, downtown Bend since 2014 with his wife and dog. And they also, since 1995, have managed uh, Mule Shoe Creek Ranch on the John Day River. Why I think he put together this presentation is because he led a volunteer team that created a central west side community history, Timbertown legacies and challenges that covers most of Bend's neighborhoods. And then last but not least, he was part of the Bend Charter Advisory Committee that was in 2017. And they looked at a number of comparable cities that have ward systems in both Oregon and Washington. And they, um, had recommended that wards would give residents a more accessible and representative council. So with that, I turn it over to Richard. Thanks. Uh, what I'll do is, is just uh, uh, give some kind of a hand signal to, uh, to move to the next slide uh, when the time is right. So um, thank you for the introduction. And um, I would say that, uh, uh, I certainly have enjoyed being part of these different groups and bandits. Helped me learn fast as a new resident in 2014. Uh, I could learn very quickly by helping write and develop the community history for the uh, Central West Side Plan. And it's the first uh, area plan that the city has done where they actually put a community history along with it. And I, I have a degree in history, so I'm I'm kind of biased in that way. I think you take a look at history first. So that's what we're going to do today um, in looking at how Ben's boundaries uh, evolved, uh, the city's boundaries, and to a, probably a lesser extent, how neighborhood boundaries, neighborhood boundaries, I, as I understand it, are, are, are a fairly recent thing, the officially uh, approved boundaries that the city has created. But I, I think that uh, boundaries have been around for uh, quite a while in Bend and in most other other places. So, okay, cut my hand up. Next slide. Okay, so the, the boundaries we, uh, the neighborhood boundaries today do have something to do with history. Uh, many of them uh, evolved as boundaries before, or, or neighborhood uh, areas before the city got in the act and officially recognized neighborhood associations. And I'm not sure when that was. I think there's been informal or uh, organized associations in Bend neighborhoods probably since its very beginning in 1904. Um, this, I, I really like this slide, which is something I, I put together originally for the uh, uh, Central West Side Plan. And uh, unfortunately, I realized they hadn't updated the very last part of the slide. The very last part, uh, the, the stack of, of people or, or population should be 92,840. Uh, that's what the uh, Census Bureau or the Portland State Population Center confirmed for uh, 2020. So, um, but, the, but what the, the slide shows is that Ben has grown in a series of booms uh, and not, not any complete busts where it lost population, but booms uh, starting with the very first one in 1920. Uh, it's popul boom, the population almost increased, increased 10 times or maybe it did increase 10 times between 1910 and 1920. There was a lot happening then uh, for the sort of establishing the basic um, fingerprint of the city. 
And then it, uh, Ben grew a little bit slower. It, it uh, took 40 years to double again. By 1960, uh, it was doubling. Uh, it, we were doubling and, uh, and then doubled again in a shorter time by 1990. But then the whopper in growth uh, was the 90s uh, in terms of uh, uh, doubling uh, the 20,000 people in 1990 to over 52,000 in 2000. So uh, the last uh, 20 years haven't been the, um, the champions for, for Ben growth, but still it's substantial growth um, that we've had, we've uh, have uh, dealt with in the last 20 years. And I think we're, we probably are in better shape today than certainly than Ben was in 1990 to deal with dramatic growth um, because we've, we've done substantial plans. And the other thing we've done, uh, which I have a bias towards too, because my, my background is in mostly in transportation planning. I, the other thing we've done is invest in transportation because it's the, most, the, the thing that people notice first when you're falling behind on the growth curve. Next. So um, I, I uh, uh, I put together this, this chart of things that I think affect uh, both uh, neighborhood boundaries and affected the, the city boundaries in general and how Ben developed. Uh, and I was uh, really surprised and pleasantly surprised when I read all of the, the surveys that were done last month that the, um, uh, that the, the factors that I had identified, almost all of them are mentioned in the surveys that some of you filled out. Um, the, the ones that uh, I'd call attention to are, are these, particularly for Ben's growth. And then we'll take a look at what some of those early patterns, very early patterns were after this slide. Um, major natural features, seems like a no brainer that always affects how cities grow. And I, I, put, I identified two of them, the river and the buttes, and then non-natural features. And there's a lot of those and the more that the city grows, the more non-natural features there are. But um, they, it starts out with uh, platted or planned communities. And by planned communities, I don't mean just Northwest Crossing. Any, any uh, community that has a, a subdivision plat was a planned community, and uh, including the 1904 plat of the town site of Bend. Then, then big transportation facilities come into play, uh, particularly in Bend, uh, railroads. Railroads, uh, major railroads were here before major highways, and uh, they are extremely important because they're very hard to move once you've got it in place. And, uh, and, they, and they also have things that depend on them like mills and industrial districts that are also hard to move. Uh, then, then we have uh, major streets, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, then we have industrial districts. Industrial districts are also something that stick around for a long time and their footprint is big uh, often and it often remains. And uh, for example, uh, we have uh, the footprint of the two big mills, uh, uh, Rick Scanlon and Shevlin Hickson and the footprint remains in the old mill district. That's Rick Scanlon. And then Shevlin Hickson is across the river uh, to the on the west side um, with uh, all of the redevelopment that's occurred there. Uh, those big sites are hard to assemble again. But if you started out at the beginning, like the mills did, they had a lot of land. Then other things that are important um, equally in ter terms of how cities grow or neighborhoods grow or expand or, or, or have boundaries are parks and irrigation canals. And uh, irrigation canals is not something you'd find in every other Oregon city. So that's an unusual one for Ben's, um, Ben's growth. And then of course, school boundaries. Now the, the three things I've listed at the bottom though, walkability or bikeability, accessible neighborhood services and neighborhood cohesion are different factors and all of them are measurable, uh, but it's something that planners uh, and communities have, in some cases, have just started measuring. And um, walkability, for, for example, though, is done on a, uh, a website that's sponsored by Zillow, a real, real estate company, website called WalkScore. And it's very interesting to, to evaluate 
uh, although I know a lot of communities have, have created their own walk scores, which are probably more accurate than Zillow, but um, it's, it's still a good measurement. And the bad news from uh, walk score in, in Oregon, the bad news for Bend is, Bend is near the bottom of major cities in terms of its walk score. And part of that is, is because of some of our history and some of that rapid growth may have contributed to the original city, which we'll take a look at in a minute here, was extremely walkable, but it was compact and small. So um, let's move on to the uh, next next slide and take a look. It looks like uh, we have a hand raised by. Yeah, Kathy. we'll take a pause to, for questions or comments on this first first four slides here. Um. Yeah. This is Kathy. I don't know that my video is showing. Um, I just thought you should add the railroad to the slide. Oh, it's there somewhere. I think it's there. I couldn't see it. Yeah, Parkway. Oh, Parkway. there you go. There's railroads. OK, good. Yeah, I, I, uh, I should have put railroads first because they were actually here first before state highways got to Bend. But anyway, that's uh, uh, but they're really important. Yes, yeah. I understand they influence greatly the location of the parkway. So. Oh, yeah. OK, any other questions or comments on that introduction? If not? I don't see any. OK, here we are. 1904, the town site of Bend. Uh, uh, the, uh, the ad was advertising irrigated lands or non-irrigated lands, maybe just homestead, ads, uh, homestead lands outside of Bend, that 250,000 acres of rich land was places, in some cases, places like the Fort Rock Valley, if you're familiar with that, that it wasn't gonna become good farmland, but still um, they, they, they weren't lying about the, uh, the pine timber belt. Uh, Bend at, had probably the, some of the greatest uh, concentrations of pine in the Northwest uh, of old growth pine. One of the interesting things about the original town site flat is it's paying attention to topography. Um, it, the streets are laid out to be, a, be along the river and then other streets are laid out uh, east-west, but at the same time, they're avoiding a topographic barrier on Minnesota Street, which is a big bluff, uh, which I think was called at one time Hospital Hill because the former uh, St. Charles Hospital uh, was originally located there. And so, um, the uh, this is what I mean by a, a you know a plat. The plat, this plat, everything else grew from this point. This is like the seed of uh, the rest of the city, and um, I think we're we're fortunate that it was built, you know, that it happened right on the river because the river has been so important both as a beautiful place and as a place for jobs. It still is today. So here's the uh, the first mayor's house, uh, and you might recognize it. It's uh, yeah, it's 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 being used uh, as a, a commercial uh, site today, I believe, and it sits, I think, at just about the same place. It might have been moved, but anyway, it's a beautiful uh, Craftsman style home right on the on the river. And I think this showed the two sides of Ben's personality uh, in 1904. And I'll show you the other side in the next, in the next slide. But this, this style uh, I would call is, uh, or this type of house I call a stylish frontier house. They were, he was using um, national uh, trends in architecture at the time uh, and local materials. And then let's take a look at the next slide. Now here was uh, Ben's other image, not the stylish frontier, but the wild frontier. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the city's first school was just a log, log cabin. I don't think the city was even existing at the time, but it was a log cabin for people that had settled near uh, the central part of Bend. But you know they were training their students in, I guess, making bare rugs or something like that. But it, it showed the other side of Ben's personality, the wild frontier side. The city was also very uh, 
I was interested in improvements. And so it quickly improved uh, its original core area, but with electricity, the electric plant on the river, the Newport Dam, and uh, or near the Newport Dam, and then uh, wooden sidewalks to stay out of the dust and the mud of those streets. And so Bend was uh, up and coming city from the very beginning, but no mills yet, not in 1910. But then the big change occurred in terms of transportation, making it much easier to get in and out of central Oregon and to have things like large mills. Uh, and so this, uh, this was just, uh, day and night change uh, to early bend by 1911 when the uh, Oregon Trunk Railway made it here from the Columbia River Gorge. And you can see also an increased number of people getting around in, in uh, automobiles. And that uh, was a sign of the future in bend. So here's the two big mills. We're looking north from uh, uh, two of those smokes, three of those smokestacks on the right, you'll, you can probably identify. I believe those are the REI smokestacks um, and, the, uh, and the South Mill. Uh, that, so that's the Brooks Scanlon on the right or on the east and then Shevlin Hickson on the west side of the river. Shevlin Hickson was located uh, just above the Colorado Rapids or the, the uh, Colorado uh, Rapids Park. And uh, that was that was the they shared a common mill pond, and you can see it. There's lots of logs waiting out there to be processed between the two mills, both built in 1915. And we can also see some neighborhood development up on the upper right there. That's uh, probably Old Bend, and then parts of River West are developing uh, on the uh, upper upper left corner. Uh, and these neighborhoods uh, were plunked down really close to the these huge mills and I get you know in those days uh, maybe the uh, folks uh, just uh, didn't didn't mind as much the smoke that that came out off of the mills uh, because the, the mills were producing uh, good wages for lots of people so here we go including the mill owners who owned this who built this house on Northwest Congress Street and you probably recognize it uh, it is uh, built for the manager of the Shevlin Hickson Mill. And uh, the plan manager, unfortunately, um, uh, contract, uh, Tom, Tom Shevlin, uh, con con contracted pneumonia the winter before the mill opened, and he was supposed to be the manager. So I, I believe that the house was probably built for him because he was involved in all the plans for the Shevlin Hickson Mill. Brilliant guy, head of his uh, championship football team at Yale. Then we saw um, first schools or first substantial schools being built in right about the same time. The mills were being built uh, in 1914, 15 and, and Reed School, uh, the first substantial downtown school. And I believe the first school with indoor plumbing was, uh, was built. Okay, any, any questions uh, or comments on what we've just seen? Okay, um, 1917 is, is uh, the map is on here uh, because of a couple of things. It is uh, a extreme, an extremely accurate map put out by the Sanborn Insurance Company um, in um, that was a major insurance broker at the time. And they, um, they managed to uh, convince industries and home, sometimes homeowners, but industries and commercial development all over the United States that they needed the Sanborn maps. And the Sanborn maps are extremely detailed. And if you live in an area of the city where you, uh, where you have these maps, they're gonna tell you a lot about who lived there before uh, how many bedrooms there are on the house. They even go down to the detail of uh, pointing out where, where the outhouses were. And so uh, they're, they're a map series that's, that's really valuable. But what it's showing here too is that 
bend has 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 started to grow from the small downtown seed uh we are now we now have uh growth in several directions uh on on the uh, particularly on the west side of the river uh in um uh, and uh, i think it's mostly in river west and uh, then on the uh on the east side of the river old bend has completely filled in and we're starting to see growth to the east side of the railroad, uh, which is um, our, uh, which are, you know, several, several uh, current neighborhoods uh, occupy, but the railroad really is the big uh, important thing here. The, uh... go ahead. Uh, Richard, thank you. I was just curious, is this, the railroad right here at this point, or is it? Yes, yeah, that's time. the railroad. Yeah, and the the other thing you you see here is that uh, the the mill railroad peels off at the south end uh, to the left, and so that's the mill railroad that served both of the mills, and the mills had um, miles and miles of railroad track to the south of Bend all the way to Shamalt, and they so the, the footprint of the mill was was much bigger than this. And there's actually, I believe, a mill uh, stub railroad that went from uh, uh, Ben to Sisters uh, uh, through through the Shevlin Hickson mill on the west side. So the, the the both these companies were very big into large scale logging that needed railroads to uh, get the logs out. So all those. Uh, uh, where did all those students live? Well, here's Delaware Avenue in uh, 1921. The, uh, this shows something else that was not rare, but it was uh, pre pretty remarkable about Bend and it's, it's the two big mills. Uh, this was uh, probably subsidized housing for uh, Shevlin Hickson employees. It was called a model neighborhood uh, and it, um, uh, this neighborhood, uh, according to uh, most reports, uh, a lot of these houses could have been built by uh, mill workers because the, the companies provided subsidized lumber for their, uh, for their workers to build their own houses. Why would they do that? The, the, they were looking for a more stable workforce. There's a lot of unrest in the Northwest at the time among uh, mill workers, but not not in Bend. These were happy workers because there were happy families here, and the uh, both mills felt that uh, family uh, employees were better than uh, non-family employees, and so they tried to make some good places for them to live. They also created, I think, some of ben, one of Bend's first hospitals. There was a hospital just for mill workers. Uh, located uh, right near the Colorado Avenue Bridge on the east side. Richard, it looks like David has a question. Yeah, go ahead. I, I noticed that we are recording. Are you going to give us a link to that recording that we can share with our boards? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on, next. So here's, here's another snapshot of the city, uh, 1926. Uh, these are actually my favorite maps, along with the Sandborn maps. Uh, with Sandborn maps, you can find you know, all kinds of little details, uh, but um, with the US ge Geological Survey maps, you see, see things um, that are prioritized. It'll tell you where uh, the, um, you know, that the, the Dells California Highway was now stretching north and south of Bend. Very important because that was showing that the the, uh, the state highway system had just been created a few years before that, and they were getting, um, uh, you know, Bend was getting a tremendous amount of north-south traffic um, uh, on that Dallas California highway. So, um, but it also shows the city is growing a little bit around the edges again, um, and. Uh, uh, growing, you know, going to the east 
and along the river to the north too, and I think on both sides of the river. So um, we, and we also see that Shevlin Park is on the map and it was created in the early 20s. So that makes sense. The US Geological Survey usually picks out everything. The other thing too, that's interesting to look at is the, uh, uh, the West Hills of Bend, almost unpopulated, are reviewed and, and the other Southwest neighborhoods. Um, and also uh, not much population around Pilot Butte either. So this is 1926. So the, um, and it, it also, it also shows in the very bottom corner something called, can't, can't read it, or bottom of the, uh, a logging railroad. Uh, you may not be able to read that, but there's railroads going, more than one railroad going south, not the, the main line was the Great Northern and there were these logging, logging railroads going in all directions to, to, uh, to the south of Bend. Okay. So here we are, another view. We're looking straight down Wall Street on the right there uh, to the two both mills. Uh, you, they're, they're two, the two of them are kind of joined together in the, in the picture, but um, they're both there. And you also get a, a picture of how the downtown was growing and also very uh, good details on um, uh, River West. So the, it, with, with, I believe the, the North Bridge that's visible is, uh, uh, let's see, gotta go back to the, uh, new, the Newport Avenue Bridge is, is easy to pick out. Uh, the also in this is the I believe the the famous Pilot Butte Inn is is also in this photograph somewhere near where Newport crosses the uh, after Newport crosses the river, but um, it shows how important the uh, that new the Dallas California Highway is. It the, it sticks out you know like a big snake at the top, and it went straight down Wall Street, and and I think then it cut across on Franklin. To, to hook up with the highway south of town. But um, the um, interesting thing about this, this view is uh, we're seeing growth on both sides and the downtown is getting, the downtown's getting larger, more with at least with two story buildings. Okay, so this is uh, pretty close to the same, same period of in the downtown, but now we're starting to see the neighborhoods to the south uh, creeping out beyond the mill, the, the Brooks Scanlon Mill here on the on the uh, south end of the of this uh, map, um, and and we're seeing uh, little uh, pockets of of new neighborhoods growing uh, southward, particularly and and north. Uh, on this map, so the the uh, the neighborhoods uh, seem to have grown, you know, uh, in a in a pretty orderly pattern coming out from the downtown. The only thing that's not or, uh, orderly or, or that interrupts the pattern is the two big lumber mills because they're occupying a lot of space. But I think it is significant that by 1928 uh, there were there were uh, been neighborhoods to the south and. I, I'm, uh, Picking up, I think it's in uh, Southern Crossing. Um, uh, Southern Crossing, I think, that is picking up some some uh, growth right at that period of time. Uh, so it's the um, the land uh, was was providing housing there uh, as as early as 1928, or at least uh, the lots were platted and laid out. Other things to look at too, as the as the city grows, is the where do where do citywide facilities locate? And um, Ben High School uh, was built in 1925 in the downtown, and it stayed as the high school until 1956, when it jumped the tracks and went east. And so that's an important uh, indicator of growth or change. And I think the, the same story could be told about uh, 
uh, the uh, St. Charles Hospital. I'm not sure when, I think St. Charles waited to the 70s to begin developing its campus uh, where it is today, but it was originally right, right in the heart of downtown uh, along with the high school. But the, uh, the high school uh, was also important for a source of civic pride because the, uh, the architect who designed the high school also did design the Kenwood School and a number of other important buildings in the, in the Central Bend. So uh, now we jump to the, the 30s here and, and things are still are, uh, breaking out further except they haven't jumped over Pilot Butte yet to the, to the east side. But I, we are, we're seeing um, a, a gradual increase of neighborhoods at the foot of Aubrey Butte and also uh, to the north along the river. Um, so it's, um, uh, but most, there's a lot of undeveloped land around and these, uh, uh, this particular map series shows the owners of the land. Uh, the Metzger maps are useful from, from that po point of view. So they show large, they show where there's large undeveloped tracks. And I think it also show, it starts to show irrigation canals, but irrigation canals had been here very early since uh, the first decade of the, of the 20th century. Next one, yeah, here's just the south side picture and more, even more uh, pronounced uh, growth to the south, kind of following, I think it, I think the dark line is the California uh, Dallas Highway, uh, not the railroad. I think the railroad was on a separate, uh, uh, is uh, not, maybe not as prominent now. The highway is, is uh, my naive conclusion would be the highway was, uh, was attracting growth south, uh, and uh, the but the logging railroads are still there producing for those two big mills, and uh, the most of the forest lands they used was to the south of Bend, all the way to Klamath County. So, um, yeah, last slide in this group here uh, is Wall Street in the 30s. It looks pretty prosperous. It doesn't look like there's a depression here. Bend, uh, by having these two stable, huge employers, avoided some of the worst of the 1930s uh, depression. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, it, because it kept stable employment, but also you, the same thing is shown in that population chart. I think we had, for, we had relatively little population growth, if any, in the 1930s, but all these businesses look like they're well patronized. So let's let's uh, pause there and take questions or comments on, the, on what we've just looked at. Sounds like good. I heard someone there. <laughs> Okay, next. Um, so uh, we're taking a, a, a big leap here, but it's still showing that what had been established in the 30s, this is the city's official map. Uh, and it shows that uh, what, had, what had already happened was continuing to happen with new um, subdivision flats being added uh, everywhere except to the, uh, uh, everywhere except to the Southwest but they were uh, add, being added west and north. And uh, um, also there was, the city had even identified an industrial area uh, along the railroad tracks on the, on the right-hand corner there, uh, going south out of the city to the, it would, uh, the new industrial area, still an industrial area today, uh, would be from uh, east of Brook Scanlon or east of, of Third uh, Street south into the south from there um, on the east side of Third Street going going south along the railroad. So uh, Pilot Butte though is still there, uh, haven't jumped 
took up over the, the top of Pilot Butte in terms of neighborhoods at this point, but um, it, it shows that it might happen. I, I suspect that uh, the uh, Pilot Butte was made a state park to perhaps uh, preserve some of that green space as, as people could see the city was moving to the east. And uh, it, it also helped that the, uh, uh, the publisher of the Bend Bulletin, Robert Sawyer, was on the State Highway Commission in the 30s, um, which happened to run the state park system at the time. So that's why he has a park named after him north of uh, the north side of the city. And uh, getting towards the wrap up here, and I, I apologize, I haven't documented the 21st century much. Uh, where actually, uh, yeah, because our, uh, our central west side history really looked at things up until the 1990s. Uh, but here we go with a 60s view of, uh, down at the bottom of the, of the slide is uh, a, uh, the box factory and a building called the Crane Shed, which was uh, uh, demolished in the middle of the night a few years ago. Uh, great, a great loss of those Brick Scanlon buildings. Uh, but the, uh, uh, it also shows you uh, that uh, their, their, uh, the Colorado Rapids area was still, unused, a lot of it was unused uh, industrial areas. Um, so it was very ripe a few years later for the old mill district. Uh, the, uh, but the other, other thing that's, that's interesting is uh, Aubrey Butte is starting to see some development uh, on major roads leading up the Butte. And so that's, um, it's not new, but it is uh, a, a evidence showing that uh, growth is definitely heading that way on the west side too. So the, the downtown area is, uh, is well depicted in this, in this shot here and, the, uh, uh, and, and Drake Park, which is the large collection of trees up in the middle of the picture. Yeah, those are part, parts of Drake Park and the, and the Drake Park neighborhood. And here, here's the, the last piece of evidence I've got, which shows all of the things that I've mentioned before, actually, but a little bit more. This is the night, the 1975, and I, uh, the next thing I should get for to complete this show is uh, the latest USGS map of the same area, because they they keep the their uh, they keep the most consistent themes, and they'll tell you the most about what's happening in an area. But by this time, uh, the development, and I think uh, on the upper right-hand corner is the beginnings of the uh, St. Charles Hospital with some some larger buildings up in there, uh, upper right. Uh, yeah, um, and so the, the the city has jumped Pilot Butte by this time, and uh, that's not surprising since the uh, uh, the 70s were uh, somewhat of an uptick in growth, but uh, not as much as what would come along in the 90s. However, um, the other things it shows is that the city is, is filling in uh, and it does show a, uh, a, uh, a popular new road on the, on the, south, uh, on the uh, left corner or uh, southwest corner of the map, uh, Century Drive, heading out south to uh, Bachelor View. And uh, so it's, um, each one of these maps shows kind of a series of, of uh, development and different things that get introduced. But uh, uh, overall, uh, it, it shows actually a pretty orderly pattern. I don't know what happens. So if you turn the page and then uh, look at a, a map from, from uh, 2000 or, or from, uh, uh, you know, it, but I, I need to get that into the series here to show, really show that because the USGS maps are, are the best guide. And I think that the growth may not have been as orderly uh, as, as time went on after 1975. So just to, to wrap up here, 
one of the things as you're looking at, ahead and thinking of, uh, you know, how you might, uh, might, might or might not uh, make any changes on neighborhood boundaries, one of the things I think to look at is the complete communities um, uh, goal that is in our comprehensive plan. It's, it's um, I think a new idea, but it's an old idea too, because I think that those original um, core uh, sections of Bend were evolved as complete communities. And now we want to do it a little more deliberately than that was when it was done in the uh, 19, 20s and uh, and and it's also uh, a challenge to uh, today is more of a challenge to make men walkable because it's so large and to make neighborhoods walkable too because they're because uh, they're uh, not maybe as, as tightly connected as they were in that original fabric so anyway uh, I think that concludes my uh, my uh, review oh and also in the comp plan the uh, the, 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 there's an identification of six different neighborhood types, which I think is, is useful sort of as a background for where Ben might go in the future. I know that in the future, the comp plan uh, seems to favor complete communities, not scattered, uh, more not scattered suburban uh, uh, development. So, uh, which I, I believe was the case for Ben in the, uh, in the mid or the late part of the 20th century. So, uh, any any comments or questions to add? I think I'm I'm about concluded. Thank you so much, Richard. I think um, I was just thinking about the the time frame between '75 and and the 2000s, and yeah. the first neighborhood association was formed in 2001. Uh, and that was Southwest Bend. So at this point, Southwest Bend really isn't existing uh, <laughs> as far as a part of being being a part of the city of Bend. Um, and so I know, you know, David could probably speak to the the 90s and that I believe is when Old Farm was annexed in. So there's still some of that, that history piece that um, would be really interesting to learn. So maybe we can um, touch base again. Yeah, if I can get the um, uh, get get some more maps that will show that, uh, I'm sure I could show that and uh, add the uh, the 20th century, 21st century on us at the tail of the of the dog here. Yeah. So that would be great. Um, does anybody else have questions for Richard? Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Um, before we wrap up here today, I just want to provide. Uh, a little update on where council is at with uh, goal setting. So I'm going to pull up my tracker here. It's a little easier to show if you're a visual learner. Share. Okay. So um, at this point, uh, council is currently in the process of setting their two year goals. As you know, we did the community survey um, in November and December. We did the listening sessions in January, and then the council had their first goal setting uh, workshop, if you will, uh, on January 20th and 21st. And during those workshops, they were able to identify some of the high priority um, focuses for the next two years. Uh, for council goals this time, that would be affordable housing, effective and efficient city operations, public safety. Um, and so they're identifying those same categories for the next biennium. Um, right now, what we know is there's affordable housing, uh, transportation is still in the mix. Um, and then I, I sent out community survey results. So if you wanna see how the community ranked it, I would feel I feel like the counselors are aligning pretty closely with uh, with the community's input. So um, that is good news. What we don't know yet is where boundaries will fit into those focus areas. Um, we believe that we will be able to move forward with this review of neighborhood boundaries, um, but we won't have a good idea 
of where they lie within council goals until about the end of March. So um, the end of March is when they produce the work plan that is probably similar to what a lot of you guys have seen where it identifies the council goal areas and the strategies to accomplishing those goals under each. Um, and so that's where we should be able to see uh, a review of neighborhood boundaries. So with that, um, we're kind of playing it by ear right now. And so I would say that a March meeting is uh, probably TBD, depending on if we have more information than we have right now. Um, I do know that we are looking to put together a boundaries workshop uh, later this spring. And so something that this group needs to decide is uh, if we want to move forward with uh, an outside party and consultant to facilitate that workshop. Um, and that would be something where we bring in all of the neighborhood association chairs to discuss, as well as the NLA reps, um, and really try to get a focus on what are we trying to do here? Are we just updating the city code so that neighborhoods can adjust their boundaries as they wish to? Um, is it something bigger than that where we're looking at ward systems and um, have it, how we can represent our members more effectively? So um, right now we're still kind of in that information gathering process. So do any of you guys have questions about kind of where we're going from here or um, what to do in the meantime. So it sounds like um, we had tentatively set the first week in March um, as our meeting date and that we're on hold until um, we have more information and to see if we're going to meet in March or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm uh, seeing right now. I think that we can always do some uh, anticipating of our project being accepted by council and, and where are we going to go. And so Karen, maybe you and I can get together and, and talk about maybe what a work plan could look like, um, depending on, on if council accepts that or not. Okay. Well, I think the presentation gave us a good um, foundation just about how neighborhoods started and then we'll see where we're going to go with that. Yeah. I know one thing that we talk about um, at the city is, you know, it's it's useful to look back and see where we came from, um, but really this is about where we're headed and how we can best serve the residents of Bend, knowing what that culture was like uh, back when Bend first began in the early 18 or late 1800s. Um, Hans. Yeah, just a thought that um, sub subject to what council, what we hear from council uh, as far as a March meeting, it did occur to me that along with this presentation, which stimulates some thought, um, we could potentially use March as a bit of an outline in terms of just high altitude. Um, mm -hmm. our, our actual work plan will be largely a factor of what council says, but we could address things like uh, definition of a neighborhood or considerations for neighborhoods. Some of the stuff that Richard's presented in, in our survey shows maybe just a, a very high level outline of how we might go about this. And then obviously it wouldn't be wasted work, but it would be modified once we hear from council. We'll either be a little more broadly focused or more narrowly focused. Uh, maybe, maybe our timeline changes instead of a vision that reaches out and says, What's, what does this look like when we look at boundaries again in 10 or 15 years? But I don't think spending some time on an outline would be a waste of time for March. It'd be a great time to do some brainstorming. Yeah, I think that that's a, a great idea. And um, I think what one thing that we do know for certain right now is that everyone agrees the code is inadequate to do what we need to do as Bend grows. And so I think that that will be a good starting point for this group um, is, is working with our legal department to update that code and defining some of those um, key keywords and pieces that go into what a neighborhood is, is a big part of that. Go ahead, Hans. Yeah, just one more consideration, whether it's for the March meeting or going forward. One of the things I think a lesson learned from our land use education group is that um, it would have been useful to include some other stakeholders, if you will, other points of view. Mm -hmm. um, 
getting more perspectives as we move forward on this. And, and certainly so that we don't get too far down the road, assuming council is very supportive, that we don't get too far down the road and then have someone say, well, wait, you didn't, didn't give consideration to this group of people or to this physical situation or to this plan for the future. Um, you know, it's always good. Um, many hands make for light lifting. So if we have some stakeholder groups that want to help us with that, you know, maybe it's the Homeless Leadership Coalition because homelessness is a big factor of, of something that is really on our plate right now. But just a thought that as we do some of this brainstorming, and especially as we get into a workshop, maybe there are some other stakeholders that would bring some, something to the table as well. That's fabulous. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, and I think to, uh, to that note, when we're talking about community, the inputs and, and coming up with this plan, um, on Tuesday of next week, we're going to ask the NLA just for permission to use some of the NLA funds for a workshop for boundaries. And so um, I didn't want to surprise you with that. <laughs> that's, that's a request that's going to come up, but this group is going to decide how we're going to do that workshop um, and, and maybe put together some key points and what we're looking for from someone to, to run that. So you'll be largely in charge of directing how that is spent, um, but we need the NLA's permission just to spend the money. Great. Well, it sounds like um, we, um, unless other people have questions or comments that that concludes this meeting. Does anyone have anything they want to add at this time? Just Richard, thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. And then we'll send out the link. I guess Michaela will send out the link so we can share it with our own boards and neighborhoods. Um, because it is that was really interesting for the historical perspective. So yeah. with that, you, I, sorry, Karen. Sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to include the link in the weekly report that I send out so that just everyone can have access to it if they're interested? I, I think so. I think um, it would be of interest to the public as well. So if you just send the link in the weekly news, that'd be great. Sure. Okay. Happy to do that. Okay, so I guess with that, um, five minutes early, um, we'll adjourn this meeting and then stay tuned for next steps. And thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>